identity and function together to give you the complete picture. And Sal has already talked to you about that. So I'm going to move on a little bit now and talk just a, a bit about looking at the very small veins in the brain. And although I don't have these results here, I will tell you about Robert Sadatinov's work. This is really a wonderful example where in, in five to ten minutes we can get a picture of all these small vessels in your brain, some of these as small as two to three hundred microns. And on the right hand side you have an example of a, a, a cadaver brain where a dye was injected in a radiographic image of state. And my students are very happy that I, I don't sacrifice them to prove this. So luckily, uh, luckily George Salomon did all this work for us over about a 30 or 40 year time period. And uh, he said, kindly sent me this picture because you can see the match is almost perfect. So it, it, it's no surprise if I tell you I think I'm looking at veins with this technology. And indeed, they, they are veins. And um, this is an interesting example to show you that when I see these very dark structures, why do I see them? I see them because they have deoxyhemoglobin in them. And, and so the deoxyhemoglobin acts like a, a paramagnetic substance and it causes a reduction of the signal in the brain. And on the right-hand side is a volunteer who basically had two cups of coffee. He took a no-dose pill, 200 milligrams of caffeine. And you can see these vessels even better. In fact, you can see even smaller vessels right by the arrow here that weren't visible before. Now, why is that? That's because caffeine is a vasoconstrictive agent, and it slows the blood flow to the brain. So we actually see more of these small veins. So you're actually looking at the reactivity of the brain, so to speak, under some type of stress. In this case, it's a caffeine stress. So what Robert did is he used this technology uh, to look at what's happening in MS patients. And he found that, in fact, he couldn't see as many veins on more severe MS cases. Now, that's a little strange, because if you have reduced blood flow, why, why wouldn't I be seeing this caffeine effect? Well, if you have reduced blood flow and reduced blood volume, or reduced blood flow and brain tissue that's actually not functioning and not taking up the oxygen as it's supposed to take it up, in fact, the vessels, as you see them here, will begin to disappear. Now, this is actually in fairly good agreement with work by Yu Lin Gu from New York University, who spent the last five years demonstrating that there appears to be reduced perfusion to the brain in MS patients. And maybe some of the effects we're looking at, that David was suggesting something else was going on, could in fact be caused by hypoxia. If you're not getting enough oxygen to the tissue, then the, there are going to be immunological effects associated with this. So what, what role does hypoxia play? And eventually, I can tell you that in some of the lesions, when we do perfusion imaging, we don't see any blood flow there at all on some chronic lesions. That means that that tissue is probably ischemic. There's, there's no functioning there at all. If I were to do MR spectroscopy and try to measure NAA, I might not see any presence at all. So the, the, the longer these lesions are there, probably the worse off the tissue is at that point. So we, we saw one of those before. Um, I, I want to just point out, to go with this picture that Fabrizio showed, we did a plot of 100 normals to plot how much iron they have in different parts of the brain. And all these little pink dots and blue dots, they represent normal people. And you can see that the amount of iron increases as you get older. Well, I do like to quote Burton Dreher on this. He, he says that we all rust when we get older, so we have to kind of map how much rusting is taking place. And all of these triangles and the X's that are in this plot, they're MS patients. So you can see none of my 100 normals fly up at this high level of iron that we see in MS. Now this may be a little hard to see, I'm sorry, but, but it's quite an impressive result that it literally is hot off the press. I got it yesterday morning from the students. We, we did 53 MS cases and looked at 106 measurements, so we did left side, right side, and we looked at seven areas in the brain, the basal ganglia and the thalamus and pulmonar thalamus, and all the red X's represent the, the increased iron content in MS patients. And all the blue dots, and as you can see, there's perhaps 10 of them, represent 10 out of 272 measurements on normals. Those are the only 10 that show on this plot. So you can see that it's quite impressive that there definitely is 
abnormal eye in the present in a large number of the MS cases. Not all of them, because there's only about 30 here out of 106. So roughly 30% are present. Now, the, the early work by Adams shows that there is, in fact, hemosiderin in about 30% of MS lesions. Not all MS lesions show so evidence of perhaps microbleeding or hemosiderin, but some do. So here I want to show you an image of the thalamal striate area. This is the normal veins in, in this part of the brain. And you don't see any dark effects like I showed you in the previous image. And, I, and then Fabrizio showed this picture. And here is an image now of an MS patient. And in each of these areas, we're looking at iron increases in the area of the draining veins of each of these structures. So could it be that the iron is related to a breakdown of the venous endothelial system? Yes, it's possible. Does iron leak out and cause um, problems? Well, we know iron is very toxic. We've known this for 100 years. And I'm still not sure that anybody neurologically has demonstrated that, that iron in any of the diseases, whether it's Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or, or MS, has really led to a degeneration of the, the brain tissue. But it's possible. Um, it's also possible that iron is just a biomarker of the degradation that's taking place locally. Maybe it, it doesn't have a direct physiological effect. So we don't know the answer to this yet, but we do know that the more iron that is present, that we tend to have more serious effects. So let me skip ahead here. And now I, I want to go on to um, show you just two slides of some perfusion work. We usually use perfusion weighted imaging to measure local cerebral blood volume, cerebral blood flow, mean transit time in the tissue. We do this a lot for stroke imaging, for example. And we can show very nice the vascular territory that's been affected. But this technique I'm going to tell you just a little bit about, without any equations, is we call it the tissue similarity map. And basically what we do is this. Is we follow the time course of how the contrast agent gets taken up over a period of about one minute. And we watch this change in signal, and we take from one region of interest that signal change, and we ask, how does this correlate with the vascular response everywhere else in the brain? It's very much like functional connectivity. So what we did in this particular case is we took one of the lesions in the flare data, we highlighted a small area in one lesion, and then we ran it through this process. And you can see here in the middle image, all of the areas that are dark blue, dark blue means that it behaves the same as the previous tissue. So that's easy to understand in this case. Dark blue means zero. So if the signal is the same in two pixels and I subtract it, I'm going to get zero. So I don't, it's not that simple, but it's that idea. So you can see here that if I draw the following area here, I pick up all these other lesions. That suggests to me that the vascular connectivity of these lesions are all related, maybe because they're related to the same venous drainage system. But it's pretty amazing. We've done this in 10 cases now. And if I draw the lesion here, I pick up this entire area by the ventricles, showing that they have exactly the same vascular functionality associated with them. And then this is just two more examples. And perhaps the upper case is the more interesting one. Not only can we pick up all the lesions here from this technique, but you can see that there's a, a connectivity. I'm going to show you the right-hand image now. The right-hand image is a, a reversal of the central image, showing the lesions as bright or red. You see the green area that's connecting these lesions. It doesn't show in flare at all, but it has a very similar vascular behavior to the area of the lesions. And so my guess is that this may be representing the vascular territory that is most affected by this disease. So this is an area still of study, but also demonstrates the role of the vascular problems that we may be dealing with in multiple sclerosis. Well, even though I'm not focusing on, on uh, Tracy Putnam's work, I, it's hard not to show this quote. It was a wonderful quote from, uh, from Gray's Anatomy that, that Sal showed. But, so what, what Tracy Putnam did in 1935 is he did 14 dogs and he occluded the small veins in the dog brain. And over the period of a year, all these dogs developed sclerotic lesions. So he says, the similarity between such lesions and many of those seen in cases of multiple sclerosis in man is so striking that the conclusion appears almost inevitable 
that venular obstruction is the essential immediate antecedent to the formation of typical sclerotic plaques. Well, I wish that he had an MR scanner or, or an ultrasound scanner or something like that in his day, because I'm sure that Tracy would have discovered what Paolo discovered very recently. So there is a lot in the literature that I can't talk to you about today, but there's 75 years of evidence of vascular involvement in multiple sclerosis. So future directions, I think it's going to be very important for us to, to do ultrasound and MR imaging pre-treatment, to continue to characterize the type of venous problems that are there, uh, to ensure that the patients are, are able to get imaged again for perhaps a year after surgery and can compare their data from before surgery. Um, from a science point of view, it's going to be very interesting to study the fluid dynamics of the venous system and understand the cardiovascular input-output and how that might be changed because of this chronic cerebral spinal venous insufficiency. And then I think it's important for us to create an international imaging protocol and an international database for us to, to use. And so along these lines, um, one of the things we'd like to see happen, and I think Sal has suggested it and, men, and many other people are, are coming to this conclusion, that it would be very nice for us to have uh, some type of imaging database where people can send their data. We're going to need IRBs for this. But I think to characterize what's happening in MS is going to take thousands of cases for us to really understand it. And I think, you know, for the patients, things are happening very fast, things are picking up speed. I think it's quite viable that if the sites around the world combined their data, within a year we could easily have one to 2,000 cases in this database, and maybe more. So with that, I would like to stop, and thank you very much.